So I'm going to read this a little bit out to you. It's a quote from old, old England. Think about Charles Dickens kind of time. I was 12 years of age. The operation was done on the kitchen table. Nurse came, then the doctor. I had so much of a rib taken, cut down here and down my back. The nurse came to tend to the wound for several weeks. They gave me an anesthetic. The elder ones came in for the meal. The doctor said, Mrs. T, this is an ideal for a job. You couldn't have a better table. Everything had to be cleaned. And I remember the nurse saying, you've got everything just right. You've even got the bucket for the blood to my mother. Is this lay care or formal care? That was quite graphic, wasn't it? <laughs> but that was 100 years ago in England. And obviously, this young girl had so much of an operation taken, they took some, something out of her. And her mother prepared everything. You know. But there was a nurse, and there was a doctor. And there was so much of an operating theatre, you know, kitchen table, that was. Everything had to be cleaned, and they even had... Then there was a nurse that had a, um, a bucket for the wound. So the boundary is not clear, but we know that a lot of lay care is, takes place, and even till today. Lay care takes place, the differences that are at home. Formal care usually takes place in a formal sitting, in a health centre, health facility. Lay care, informal training, usually a family member. In this case, it was the girl's mother. She orchestrated a lot of her health care, didn't she? Then there is a formal training, um, which is given, you know, how many years of medical school? Many of us? Five years? Six years? Seven, seven years? years? Seven years. There you go. Nursing also, a degree. Pharmacy, master's degree. Yeah, so long, long training for a lot of the um, formal carers. And paid, hopefully, some of us. <laughs> Lay care, unpaid. Okay, so these are quite important distinctions, but the boundary is not necessarily clear cut. Remember that pyramid I showed you earlier? There was a whole section that was lay care. The majority of the care are provided by lay people. And we can imagine if all that lay care converted to formal care, we would think that all the problems we're trying to work out about health services, giving resources, the best way of funding models, everything, oh, there will be a piece of cake compared, you know. So much, if, if, if all of, those peop of the health that is provided by lay people, that shifted, that would totally shift the dynamics and the, and the, and the impacts it has on, on the resources needed for formal care. But how people seek formal care is fundamental to the lay care that's been provided. Before they even come to the general practitioner or the, or the pharmacist in the community, they probably already asked the mum, the dad, the spouse, wife, friends, probably. It, also, if, them, if their family member said, oh, no, I think you better just check that with a doctor. I don't think you're doing it right. <laughs> I don't think we can cope. Let's go see a doctor. That, that has the implications on how people seek health care. It's part of illness behaviour, which we'll talk about more on Friday. But it's important to know that as we are looking at health services, we are only looking at the pyramid that's above. And there's so much of lay care that we don't know about. Very few studies. And obviously, no routine records. We have no medical notes on that part of care. So this is from, check the source. Uh, in England, they have tried, to, some one of the policy think tanks, um, have tried to quantify how much of this informal care, lay care costs. And there's a lot, basically. Uh, the figures are up there. This was in 2015. Lay care mainly takes three forms. And as a patient or a friend, you've all given lay care when you're not being your professional doctor or a pharmacist. Um, mainly providing information and advice. We've all 
um, given our relatives um, some friends, some advice on the health aspect of the health. Um, emotional support, this is really crucial. And it can be the form of a listening ear just for a friend. Um, or it could be just supporting them through so someone's broken their leg and you've given them some, some company. That's really important as well. But practical assistance, that's a, that's a major aspect. And that a lot of um, lay care is giving practical assistance. You know, in, uh, mostly social care, helping people with activities of daily living, elderly relatives, washing, etc. But increasingly so in, giving, in taking part in giving formal medicines, you know, home dialysis, for example, so much of it is given by fa family relatives. If you can't have home dialysis, if you don't have a family to look, help you with it or a friend, you'll be in hospital having dialysis. Right? So it's really key. A couple of studies that show um, you know, patients' relatives, what kind of care they've been giving. For heart failure patients, their relatives have been give, monitoring their symptoms, giving medications, dressing, bathing, health seeking. If they weren't there, it would be different health professionals doing that. Similarly, renal dialysis we mentioned. So lots of practical assistance there. Okay, so who are the carers? Who are these people? Some studies have shown that for patients with motor neuron disease, 68.5% of the carers are female. I mean, it reflects who the disease groups are, but they're not young, mean age, 63.2 years old. How many weeks spent car caring? Look at that. It's quite a lot, isn't it? Imagine all these people were not available, giving this many hours of care, and that all converted into formal care. How much, um, how, how much more resources? Um, it's needed 70 hours plus. It's remarkable. These people are undocumented. Right. Okay. Interesting finding. So I said they were mostly female in the previous study. This is um, a study done um, looking at couples now. And these both couples are employed. Um, and, and this is a study for with uh, medical couples. So both spouses are doctors, have good jobs, basically are in employment. And when they said, when your child's sick, who stays at home? These are the answers. So if they were fathers, 40, when the 40 percent said they, 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 they stayed at home, 41 percent they said, oh, 50, 50 kind of thing, it all depends. But if they were a mother, they said, I stayed at home most of the time, not my spouse. And the rest of it is it depends. Interesting, isn't it? Thought, oh, no, well, they are not fathers the breadwinner. No, these are all medical couples. Um, so both have equally important jobs, you can argue. Um, and also, interestingly, and they asked doctors of the views, 80% view there was the wife's responsibility for caring for sick children. So these are some insights into who the carers are. Another study in, in uh, Switzerland, um, young lay carers. So we've got children who are also in the position of looking after elderly and others uh, who are ill, um, supporting someone. This is why, why we're talking about this. It's crucial because capacity of lay care and high middle income countries are just decreasing. More women in the labor market. I'm sure every country is facing that. Also, family obligations are weakening and most people now live in nuclear families. City living, not rural living, no longer in big extended families, four or five generations together. Greater geographical mobility. Um, so it all means that the elderly and the super elderly are living more alone in in larger numbers. And so the capacity to provide lay care to one another is rapidly diminishing. And this has huge implications. And I think also we think about social care and health care as separate, but actually a lot of that is, it, it, it has an impact on, on formal care and the way people seek health care. Okay. All right. Formal care's attitudes to health care, um, health care lay care, Really, there are really three mainstream thoughts about it. A lot of people think formal care should expand and take over lay care. This is a, a, one extreme of the thought is that, you know, the vibrant lay care, they don't know what they're doing, it's not recorded. Um, if they become too big, there's less resources for formal care. It's very out there. 
some things formal care should train and control that they care. Oh no, we, we must give them you know a system, teach them how to do it, train them, and then you know, have them under our control, and then they can be granted and give care. Yes, you, you can you can give that drug there. Yeah. That, that's the way you do it. Kind of so, so much more control. And really in the other end is formal care should encourage a vibrant and and support lay cares. They should be allowed to flourish and support to help because we actually cannot meet all those needs. Um, and, and it's important to have an alliance. It should be supported, it should be encouraged. Um, and independence encouraged. So there are different perspectives on how we should deal with this. Okay, so that's about lay care, formal care. It's good to have a perspective of what's underneath that pyramid that we can't see. <laughs>